In 2016, the English theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking said, quote, We spend a great deal of time studying history, which, let's face it, is mostly the history of stupidity. During the Middle Ages, people put their faith in things that we now know to be complete nonsense. Here we are going to take a look at some of those outrageous beliefs. Before we get into the meat and two veg of this video, we'd like to say a huge thank you to History Hit for sponsoring a video on this channel. History Hit is basically like Netflix, but for us history nerds who just can't wait to get their hands on the next instalment of all things medieval. We are huge fans of History Hit, and it's an absolute honour to partner with them for this video. It's an incredible platform, as History Hit has hundreds of expert-led programmes available online, and thousands of podcast episodes on their award-winning podcast network. Always brought to you by expert historians like Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones, and more. Even better, new content is being added all the time, as they add 19 podcast episodes and two new programmes every single week to their online history channel. While Dan Snow's History Hit is probably the one you're most likely to have heard of, they also have eight fascinating podcasts, including Gone Medieval, which we've been keeping on pretty constantly recently. There are hundreds of hours of original history documentaries available to watch anywhere, anytime, on any device. Recently, we've discovered the Medieval Pleasures series, hosted by historian Dr. Eleanor Yaniger. It's been an absolute romp through the somewhat sordid worlds of sex, booze, and sport in the medieval period. We love to get down to the nitty gritty here, and this series does not disappoint. You might think that the medieval period was all chastity belts and puritanical thoughts, but you might be surprised with what you find out. Click the link in the subscription box below to find out more, and subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, you'll get 50% off the next 3 month subscription by using our code, Medieval Madness. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video, and for helping us to get our fix of the good stuff. And now for today's video. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Water Dragons The rise of the Mongols during the 12th and 13th centuries was insane. By the time Genghis Khan died in 1237, the empire was twice the size of that ruled over by the Romans, making it the largest in history. The Mongols believed in ruthless war tactics, and were clever enough to use a mail relay system for the quick transfer of written messages. It was their intelligence and organisation that enabled them to conquer their many enemies. But they also had another belief. Water was sacred to them, and because the dragon was considered to be the king of the water, it meant that it was in charge of the water cycles. So bathing or washing clothes in a river or stream showed great disrespect and contaminated the water, infuriating the dragon. This meant that the Mongols' hygiene practices left a lot to be desired, because never bathing or washing clothes causes quite a stench. Please, dear viewer, if you learn one thing from this video, it should be to wash yourself. The Flemish Franciscan explorer William of Rubrecht noted that the Mongols feared the gods would send a storm to destroy their homes if they used clean water to clean clothes. He said, quote, Thunder they fear extraordinarily, and when it thunders they will turn out of their dwellings all strangers, wrap themselves in black felt, and thus hide themselves till it has passed away. And although Rubrek was shocked to see the men empty their bowels and relieve themselves in public, he noticed that they were very careful not to pee near a water source. Genghis Khan had dictated that this form of water pollution was punishable by death. Even an accidental splash would result in a heavy fine, and the ritual cleansing of the offender's home. The Mongol armies ate huge quantities of meat, including mutton, lamb, wolf, horse meat, and in desperate times, the odd human or two. After eating, any grease from their hands would be wiped onto their clothing, causing them to stink even more. This aversion to washing meant that the same clothing was worn until it rotted off the body. And they were proud of their stench. Some historians believe that it was the first thing an enemy noticed before the Mongol horde arrived. If a warrior was lucky enough to be given the cloak of a great Khan, he would consider himself proud, because he would now carry that Khan's stink. The Wandering Womb The Timaeus was the only work by the Greek philosopher Plato that was available in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. Plato, like Hippocrates, was well regarded by the medievals, but he had some strange ideas about a woman's body, believing that the uterus was fearful of not being able to bear children. He thought that if the womb remained, quote, without a child for too long, it became vexed and took ill. So it was believed that the womb wandered around the body like some sort of hungry animal looking for semen. 
If it took a wrong turning, then it could, quote, block up passages of the breath and cause a sore throat or a cough or loss of voice. If it went missing under the ribs, then it could cause a shortness of breath or chest pain or indigestion. It would seem that the wandering uterus could be blamed for any illness that affected a woman. The illness became known as the suffocation of the uterus, and treatments ranged from balms and potions to pessaries. But by the 11th century, the ultimate cure for the semen-hungry womb was marriage, intercourse, and pregnancy. Although genital massage could be used as a substitute for unmarried women and nuns. Medieval doctors didn't like to suggest this treatment though, in case they were asked to perform the cure themselves, preferring instead to pass the task on to midwives. By the 12th century in Europe, if the usual treatments didn't work, then supernatural forces such as demons and the devil himself were being blamed for any so-called female hysterical behaviour. Any young woman who was just suffering from depression, any single woman or elderly woman, or one who was just considered too difficult, was likely to be thought possessed, or even cursed by a witch. To sin or not to sin. And when it came to actually getting pregnant, they had a whole new set of rules. The Catholic Church thought that it was necessary for a woman to achieve orgasm in order to conceive. Following the teachings of Galen, both the male and female seed needed to be released for conception to occur. But also according to the church, having sex for pleasure was a mortal sin. Meaning that a woman wasn't supposed to enjoy it really, but she had to really enjoy it. The Sky Ocean The English lawyer and cleric Gervais of Tilbury wrote his encyclopedia Recreation for an Emperor at the beginning of the 13th century for his patron the Holy Roman Emperor Otto of Brunswick. In it he stated his belief that, quote, the sea was higher than the land. Basing the idea on the first book of the Bible, which spoke of a vast body of water above the sky, Gervais said that the sea was either in or on the air. To prove his theory, he told the story about a village in England. One day, as the villagers were leaving the church, they noticed an anchor secured to one of the gravestones. It was attached to a rope which was pulled taut, stretching up into the clouds above. They were shocked to see the rope move, as though someone was trying to unhook it from the tombstone. It could not be moved, and eventually voices could be heard from above and a man began to climb down the rope. As one of the villagers grabbed hold of him, he died, because as Gervais says, he was, quote, suffocated by the humidity of our dense air, as if he were drowning at sea. After a while, the rope must have been cut from above and the ship sailed away because the noise of the sailors could no longer be heard. In another tale, a merchant was out at sea when he accidentally dropped his knife. At that very moment, his wife was amazed to see the very same knife fall through an open window at the merchant's house in Bristol, England. The Pest Maiden with the onset of the Black Death wiping out up to a third of the European population, it isn't hard to imagine the survivors reaching out for someone or something to blame. That was all part of the horror of the 14th century plague. No one really knew what had caused it, so no one knew how to avoid becoming infected. The best minds at the University of Paris blamed earthquakes and the alignment of the planets. This supposedly caused storms that spread the pestilence released by the quakes around the Earth. Of course, the ordinary people didn't understand such academic notions. For them, the plague could only be a punishment from God and an omen that the end of days was coming. One of the most well-known beliefs of how the disease was spread came from Austria. There, the pest maiden, or pest Jungfrau, flew over the land surrounded by a blue flame, spreading her sickness. In Scandinavia, she rose from the mouth of a dead person and flew away to infect anyone nearby. In Lithuania, she allowed the plague in by waving a deadly red scarf through the door or window of a house. One brave villager waited for her to come and chopped off her arm as she waved. He died anyway, but the village was spared, the red scarf being displayed in the church as a relic. Physiognomy We've all heard the expression, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, this medieval philosophy was the complete opposite. As a theory, physiognomy dates back to Roman times and became popular in the Middle Ages. It is the idea that the physical characteristics of a person can be studied in order to determine their personality, their emotions, and mental character. Using this belief, a man with a hairy chest would be grumpy, or a person with hairy hips would be lustful. Someone with a thick, bulging nose would be seen as insensitive, just like a pig. Whereas a sharp nose belonged to someone who was likely to be snappy, like a dog and the medievals held the practice in high regard. 
A scholar at the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, named Michael Scott, no relation, encouraged the use of physiognomy. He told the Emperor that it would help to distinguish between good and evil. Even now, evil villains are often portrayed as being scarred and disfigured. We only have to look at psychopaths like Voldemort from the Harry Potter books with his snake-like features, or the Joker from the Batman comics with his disfigured face to see where the medievals were coming from. For them, the physical appearance of the body could be seen to show the nature of someone's soul. The medievals put physiognomy up there with dream interpretation, magic, and alchemy, just behind the disciplines of medicine and astrology. It was also thought to be useful to physicians. Because by using the features of the body, such as a sick person's colouring, the way that they moved, the shape of their nose or their ears, it might help to determine a diagnosis. The Beavers and the Bees Having no internet or encyclopedias often meant that the medievals got things completely wrong. Of course, it didn't help that superstition was rife, and the weirdest and most unbelievable stories were often accepted as fact. Some of these involve animals and insects like bees, which were thought to be born of the carcasses of dead cattle. They just sort of spontaneously appeared from worms that formed in the decomposing bodies of oxen. Bees were also thought to have a king that ruled over them, and they had wars with other bees. They had laws and wrongdoers, and even punished themselves by committing a form of kamikaze self-suicide by stinger. Ironically, they were also thought to be a type of small bird, a bird that began life as a worm. Beavers were actually considered to be a type of fish. Because there were many fasting days in the Christian calendar where meat could not be eaten but fish could, this did not bode well for the beaver. Even worse for beavers, their testicles were regarded as a valued ingredient in medicines. It was thought that if the beaver was trapped by a hunter and unable to escape, it would castrate itself by biting off its very own family jewels and throwing them at the pursuer. That way, by sacrificing its furry manhood, the beaver would be allowed to leave, and then if it were ever chased again, it could just cock up its leg and show the hunters that they were wasting their time. If you only learn one thing in this video, it should be the beaver escape method. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Do you hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll see you next week for another video. Cheers!